Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 819. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 1st, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another edition of Anglican Unscripted. Uh, Many things have happened this week. We took Tuesday off so George could prep for the hurricane. The hurricane came through. And as you can see on the other side of the screen, George has survived. He'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Before we get into the program, this is a wonderful opportunity for you, the viewer, to say, I like Unscripted. I'm going to click like on YouTube and and Facebook. It's free advertising for us. We really appreciate that. And you as a viewer, I'm going to go to the comment sections because I don't think Kevin, mostly, sometimes George, was entirely correct. I have something I want to add to the conversation. Or we really pissed you off and you want to go to the comment section and let us know. That's what it's for. Please share this program with your friends, neighbors, and foes. We appreciate that very much. And about 42% of my audience has not subscribed yet. If you really want to know when a new episode comes out once or twice a week... The best way to find out is to subscribe. There's a red rectangle. There's that little bell uh, you press, and boom, you're subscribed. I'm sure you're subscribed to other channels. I'm offended if you would be subscribed to some EWTN and not Anglican Unscripted, but you don't want me to be offended. Uh, George, (laughs) big question. Uh, I got like four emails. Is George okay? uh, What's going on? Oh, I see he did morning prayer, so he's okay. What's, What's going on, George? Well, we're just fine. Uh, Shepherd of the Hills, my church, is the highest Episcopal church in Florida. What does that mean? (laughs) I don't mean by churchmanship. I mean elevation. We're about 140, 150 feet above Uh sea level when the sea is about eight miles from here. Uh, There's something called the Central Florida Ridge. Kevin lives on it down in uh, Webster, Mm -hmm. Florida, which is sort of the center of the state. A little bit of the Appalachia keeps going south into Florida. So in this part of Florida, the coast is mangrove swamp, and uh, it's like Hilton Head type uh, coast. Um, The town of Crystal River, just down the street from me, um, had about uh, six and a half, seven feet of tidal surge, so that the old downtown had seven feet of water in the streets. Uh, Here, we just had trees down, branches, and uh, the funny thing is, in Florida, the uh, very, very wealthy people live on the mm-hmm. water, and they have houses on stilts around here. And so they are all fine. Their cars got wrecked. Uh, what ha- and they have flood they're insurance. Teslas. Yes. They're te- and, we'll, uh, and the problem is we have a number of many, many uh, poor people who live in trailer parks, and those trailer parks are in less nice land which means swampy land land that is prone to flooding so we had the sheriff had to rescue about 75 people when driving around their giant swamp buggies with the huge six foot tires getting people off the roof of their mobile Mm home um and so we've got some outreach going to people uh but kevin these things happen three every three or four years and at this point there's sort of a blase attitude at least for me and many of my friends, we had a Bible study, 25 people yesterday afternoon, 4 to 5.30. None of us talked about the storm. Uh, We were so enthralled in the book of Exodus. uh, (laughs) Does God God endorses slavery? Have you read the second book of the Bible? But in in that reality, um, it's not common, but it is an accepted risk of living in Florida. Okay. The mm-hmm. last uh, hurricane that hit Florida was horrible. It took out uh, a couple mm-hmm. islands and uh, peninsulas on the west coast there, and a lot of people, rich people, lost their homes. Uh, but it is an accepted thing. It's an accepted risk. Uh, what was not an accepted risk, and something that's, that's horrible to, to watch, is a wildfire in Hawaii, in Maui. That mm-hmm. was completely unexpected. And uh, at Bible study for the next month, four or five months, I'll be talking about uh, the, the, the wildfire that took out our town. Well, it, in both ways, there's a, a factor of government malfeasance, sure. one very great, one very small. In Florida, uh, the government, through mandating insurance, 
homeowners insurance policies subsidizes people who build on land like Sanibel Island that is going to get wiped out once a generation because of just Mother Nature. But because of the uh, subsidies, essentially for the people who are wealthy, uh, who are on the coast, uh, they're able to afford to build. Our church, uh, our, our steeple is the highest point in the county. So we may be subject to wind damage, but we certainly would never be subject to water damage unless a second flood occurred with Noah going by in his ark. Uh, our insurance rates are very high because we have to subsidize uh, St. Anne's Episcopal Church in Crystal River, for sure. example, which is like two feet it's above sea. It's already underwater. <laughs> and they're, they're on, you know, they were underwater yeah. too. So the, uh, in one respect, uh, the, there is a, a government incentive to be foolish in your building. But the problem in Maui is very different when you've got super woke nut jobs running the state government who refuse to uh, cut down the uh, overgrown forest and the brush and you know, you're just waiting for some teenager to throw a cigarette butt and the whole thing was going to go up. Uh, that was a preventable tragedy. It, hurricanes are not preventable. No, I mean, uh, and our average view probably doesn't know how, how bad the insurance rates are in Florida. When I lived in Connecticut for our two cars and our lifestyle and our home and everything, I paid $380 every six months for insurance. Not bad. Uh, that's that's what it's about seven hundred bucks a year. I moved to Florida and I pay three hundred and eighty dollars a month for insurance. That, that's that yeah, that's about- an incredible change, you know. And it's yeah, you know, okay. The Florida drivers are worse, but what they have in Florida is what we call no fault insurance. If somebody mm-hmm. hits my car, my insurance company pays for it. Okay, my car, and their insurance pays for their car. Um, there's no fault involved. And that, that's what makes it pretty expensive. So. Well, as Florida things, that's the risk you take moving to Florida. Uh, not, not, not a whole lot of political risk, though. Uh, let's talk about the news, George. I have here for our number one story. Uh, the Global South has uh, published a letter this morning, and they have announced that there's going to be a primates meeting next month, but they're actually going to have an assembly next summer in Cairo. We talked about that before. Yes, the uh, Global South Primates and Global South Fellowship of Anglicans put out a letter today under the signature of the Archbishop of South Sudan, Justin Badiarama, where they essentially said, we've not been idle all this time. They had last had a communication earlier in the year in the spring. And in this letter, they said, we've set up a secretariat, a permanent office in Cairo, where we have people seconded, uh, volunteers, and a staffer uh, working. And we're going to have a meeting of the archbishops and key advisors in October. So as we plan to go forward for our assembly in uh, June of 2024, also in Cairo, this will be akin to the GAFCON conference. I don't know what the details are yet. I think that's what they're going to work on at this October meeting. But the, uh, the, the letter was very good. It was very strong. It was very confident that they see that they see the Global South, which is now 11 provinces, and there are three or four that are talking about joining. Uh, people like Nigeria are not members of the Global South, but they're sort of talking, and I'm assuming they'll be signed up and others like them. They see themselves as a faithful remnant within the Anglican Communion. They're not leaving the Anglican world, but they see their job as to proclaim the gospel and to take the fight inside to those who have abandoned the true faith of Jesus Christ. Who, and we will support conservatives in England, conservatives in the United States, and the Episcopal Church. I guess that's me. Uh, could, and we will stand with you. So they're basically flexing their political credentials and, mu- and muscle. And then also they specifically stood up for the Church of Uganda over its support of the government's anti-gay laws, uh, the sodomy laws that uh, have been rather hysterically covered in the Western press that impose the death penalty for uh, uh, homosexual assault. 
uh, of a minor or of a disabled person. Um, the church again says, we don't support the death penalty, but what we do support is the government's plan is to teach morals, to build a moral society, and to fight the intrusion of American and English Western, yeah, cultural Western imperialism, culture. Western cultural imperialism, which has got a picture of Joe Biden's face on it. And, uh, and so they, they are not cutting and running from the Ugandans. They're standing to defend them in their position. Um, this sort of a step sideways, but it's the same determination that we're seeing in the political world, in this uh, political world of saying, like Ghana is being threatened by the US, it must adopt uh, pro-gay laws. Ghana government says, no, we're not. Church of Ghana says, hell no, we won't, allow, we won't stand for this. The, uh, maybe it's the weakness of the American government. Maybe it's the fecklessness of our foreign policy. But we can't buy our way and get what we want with money anymore. Uh, the uh, third world is standing up to the U.S. But I don't put it... And to the church you know, and the Episcopal Church. Here, the West is willing to withhold money for those who don't support it. At what point did they go in and say, listen, we're going to do a virtual blockade. We're not going to trade with you anymore. Well, at what point do they you know, mm -hmm. take this a step further in order to force the West policy uh, in these, uh, you know, uh, gender and identity wars. Uh, I, I think we're to the point now where uh, the U.S. looks down upon Africa as a weak uh, continent and is willing to take on those African countries because half of them, well, half, a third have a deal with China. You know, and yeah, now, now's our time to go in there and make sure that China doesn't have a step forward. So... We, we had a small story in Anglican Inc. this week about the Diocese of Central Tanganyika. I didn't see that. In uh, Dodoma, oh, yeah. cent cent middle of Tanzania, just opened a commercial center. Uh, they're calling it an economic center. And they were given a grant of about $400,000 from, from Trinity Wall Street in the United States, uh, $400,000 from a local bank, and 400000 they raised from themselves. It basically put it a million, million two build a building which should generate about three to four hundred thousand dollars of income per year for the diocese of central Tanganyika. In other words, they're they're except the the Tanzanians are very happy to accept money from Trinity Wall Street to help them uh, create the economic machinery to be self sustaining. The Tanzanians in no way, shape or form support the U.S. political agenda, either from the church or the right. government. So it's a really bad deal for Trinity Wall Street if they think that they're buying support. Now, what that means is they'll buy, Tanzania won't join the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans until they can squeeze every last drop of money out of Trinity Wall Street. I'm being cynical, but I think that's the case. Uh, but, you know, Uganda has, uh, Archbishop Kazimba of Uganda said, we don't want your foreign money anymore because even you know you give us these moral uh virtue signaling tasks that in exchange for giving this we have to sign off on that and support this and that um either support the missionary either support the orphanage or take your money elsewhere well i mean the history has been the west taking the money out of africa we're taking your diamonds we're mm -hmm. taking your your rubber we're taking your gold uh now they're demanding that you have to believe what we believe. And I, I look at as a, a prime example, you know, South Africa is in absolute turmoil right now. Uh, there there mm -hmm. is a coming uh, civil war um, where uh, the tyranny of the majority here uh, is seeking revenge for something we thought there was forgiveness and peace for. And that seems not to have happened. No, the... Uh the the, the uh, South Africa is a mess, utter mess. Uh, the Cape Province is trying to secede. There's a movement to secede from South Africa because the Cape Town area, it's a pretty nice Still area. Right. I mean, it's it's doing okay, but parts 
uh, are just dreadful. We've got a spate of farm murders where these armed gangs will go to white owned farms and kill and torture and rape the inhabitants, try to shake them down for money. And it's not the local farm workers who are doing this, but armed criminal gangs who are going around to do this. Police are helpless. And so the farmers have had to form vigilante groups, which are armed. Kevin, when, you're, when you've got an environment where you've got uh, armed men, my, you're my age, older farmers, driving around the middle of the night with uh, machine guns, chasing after uh, black uh, criminal yeah. gangs, this is the perfect scenario for a bad situation to arise that'll spomp, prompt more racial antagonism. Um, the Archbishop of Cape Town, Tabo uh, Makoba, uh, was uh, at a ceremony uh, marking the 40th anniversary of the United Democratic Front, which was one of the anti-apartheid organizations. And he lauded all the great accomplishments of South Africa since the end of the apartheid era. And then he went on to say, but the problem is this country is so hopeless that unless we clean up our act, we're going to fall into chaos and anarchy. Makoba, like his sister, uh, was a buddy of the African National Congress. And so Makoba will criticize people uh, in the ANC, but he won't uh, criticize the whole movement. And he's been silent, as far as I can tell, on the murder of white farmers, on the... Uh, but Jacob, I think Jacob Olima, the politician who, the one who packs stadiums and leads the chant, kill the yeah, boar, yeah, kill the yeah, white man. Yeah. We don't, we don't hear anything from Tabo on that, but we do hear him uh, talk about mosquito nets and uh, global warming and this and that, all the platitudes that uh, clergy love to sprout these yes, days. They do. Sprout. sprout. Not no, sprout. you could say sprout. It's climate. Come on, sprout. All right, let's move on here to some more news. Uh, in if you go to a okay, new people Anglican Unscripted is a sister site to Anglican.inc, and we talk about stories that we post there. We have a story this week, uh, that there is a new archbishop, Kevin. Kevin, oh, Kevin. Oh, I, I, my daughter has told me the new rules we have sibling sites, sibling, that's sister sites. because we, we we don't quite know how Gender. Anglican, oh, uh, yes, Inc. yes. Self-identifies. Oh, right. so. Inc. Is it well? The, and that's the, the the folly of the English language. We don't have gender in our language. You know, and if this were Spanish site, we would know German site. Come on, but here we are English, and we don't know the gender of our uh, nouns here. Um, there's a new Archbishop of Brisbane, Jeremy Greaves, the Creedless, and we need to talk a little bit about him because. When a person attains a higher office uh, to become clergy, uh, they t make promises and uh, they sign documents. And one of those documents is, do you believe this? Do you believe that? Do you believe? Are you, you know, almost, and, and sometimes are you going to renounce Satan? Of course, the whole works. From what I'm reading, Jeremy Greaves doesn't believe in the creeds. How does this happen, George? That's Buggins' turn. It was his turn. Uh, the uh, Jeremy Greaves was the Bishop of the Northern Region of the Diocese of Brisbane, which covers South Queensland in uh, Australia. That was one of the more liberal dioceses. That's the diocese where it's had congregations flee and join the Diocese of the Southern Cross, the non-geographic diocese led by the retired Archbishop of Sydney, Glenn Davies. Well, Greaves is a liberal within a liberal diocese, meaning Greaves, in 2010, he at that time, he was the dean of the cathedral in Darwin, Australia, which is in the northern right. top end of Australia. And he identifies as a progressive Christian, which means he doesn't believe in the creeds. He doesn't believe in a literal resurrection. He doesn't believe in a virgin birth. He does. This is Jack Spong without the uh, pretense of being a theologian. But this is somebody who basically is bought into, years ago, the progressive sea of faith Christian movement that uh, all this, all the talk about Jesus and the Gospels are metaphors right. of things. You know, you know the, the, the seventies nonsense. Well, it's it's uh, the Jesus seminar nonsense. What can we take from what value does the New Testament have? And we will decide by placing little marbles on a table. You know what we believe is 
what actually happened in the times of Christ. But, you know, backing up here, at some point, he, you know, exposed liberalism and somebody had affirmed that. He says, oh, you're mm-hmm. in the right, you're in the right, you, uh, you're in the right course here, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, he was saying this when he was a cathedral dean, and then the next job is to be an assistant bishop. And he's still affirming this, and, you know, he's pro-gay marriage, pro this, pro that, he's pro everything. And Australia has a much looser uh, confederation of dioceses than, say, the United States or the Church of England, so that I don't believe it's possible for the other dioceses to torpedo him. But David Old has written an op-ed piece going into detail, which we've published on our sibling site, Anglican Inc., where David reports that senior Anglican leaders are basically saying, we got to really think this one through because this man is going to swear to uphold the doctrine and discipline of the Anglican Church of Australia. And he doesn't. I mean, he'll swear this here, but then he'll talk to a reporter there. And how do we square this with his duty to teach the faith once handed down by the apostles? Now, um, I'm sure Jeremy Greaves is a delightful man. I mean, you can't get that job without being happy. Yes. He's he's thin, he's happily married, he has two adult children, you know, he probably, but it's the content of his belief and his teachings that are problematic. So in the short run, we'll see more parishes probably opt for the Diocese of the Southern Cross, and we very very well may see some sort of theological schism or split within the Anglican Church of Australia where Perth in its craziness is now being going to be outdone by Brisbane in its craziness. I do expect more readership at the David Old uh, website. I'll put a, a link to that in the show notes here if you've not been to that. Uh, he covers news down under. He frequently comments here on Anglican Unscripted. Um, for me, it's crazy that we can have another Spong or a, a Griswold go, th- go through the system you know, and, and reach the archbishop level to the point where this man was elected archbishop and we have complete silence from around the world global south isn't saying anything uh um gafcon's not saying anything it's just a new age where this is an accepted thing it, it's not a lack of communication because we know the global south and gafcon leaders read what we write it's just that there's not the interest anymore to get engaged with it at once upon a time, uh, people would discover Jack Spong by accident, and not if you were in Africa sure. or in Asia, and you would What's come this? across this, and you'd yeah. be horrified. Nowadays, um, in your little inbox, you can read all about the latest kookiness from England or Australia, mm-hmm. and I think, I don't want to say jaded, but the instantaneous communication has lowered the... Uh, how should I say it? The reaction time of uh, people in the developing or the, world. Kind of the trigger. It's lowered the trigger. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the the African countries aren't as triggered. The Asian countries aren't, uh, I'm saying, I mean provinces, not countries, aren't as triggered. Because they're, they're used to this now. It's like hurricanes in Florida. We're just, they're used to this news coming out of the West. And uh, Jeremy Greaves is the latest hurricane out of Florida. And not a whole lot of response to it. Let's move on to our next story. I, if people don't know, I, I, I'm not in Sasquatch. I'm not at a, a different camper. I'm at Mom's. And Mom has this cool chair that just leans way back. So, excuse me if I, I use the chair for comfort. Uh, Jonathan Fletcher. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We've got Free Church of England is in the news for all the wrong reasons. Now, Free Church of England has been kind of the alt for the Church of England. If you if you can't live with what's going on in the Church of England, there is a unofficial official alternative, and that's a free Church of England. Uh, we've certainly reported that in the past. There, there was some a big story the last couple of years. There were some discrepancies with finances that got worked out. They were found to be, uh, the finances after an audit were fine. However, now the Free Church of England is in the news for all the wrong reasons even though 
The famous Calvin Robinson just joined the church recently, and so did Reverend Brett Murphy. What do they need to know about their church, George? Well, this was, I'll, I'll be frank, this was a story forced upon us <laughs> by members of the Free Church of England saying, what is going on? Can you find out? Well, this is like an African fighting about Jack Spahn. Going, what? <laughs> the the priest at the year or the minister at the free church of england congregation at shoreham by sea a lovely seaside community in the south of england named michael blades an older fellow looked to be in his late 60s early 70s by his photo passed away uh, end of august and some obituaries were circulated on uh, social media and in the obituaries it said he survived by his partner james his longtime partner james and when these obituaries sort of were read with more than just, uh, oh my, isn't it sad that he's dead? What do you mean he has a long-term partner, James? This is the Free Church of England. You can't have big gay partnered clergy. And people are posting, taking screenshots of these Facebook posts of his the de not death and send condolences to his partner, James, saying, George, what's happening here? So I looked into this reluctantly uh um there's there are other anglican news sites who just love this stuff but this is <laughs> stuff we get pulled we're into. biased obviously and so yeah this is we don't we don't want to sink a ship that doesn't need to go down the so i contacted paul hunt who's the bishop of the southern diocese of the free church of england and before i contacted him i did a little research and found that paul hunt had ordained the priest named michael blades in 2014 and i said here's what can you tell me has the church free church of england changed its view on gay marriage because we've got an obituary saying that one of your active clergy was in a long-term civil partnership and bishop hunt wrote back to me saying no we haven't changed our teaching but uh, he has always pledged to me that he was celibate and that his relationship with his long-term civil partner was celibate. And we don't uh, consider that to be a violation of the ordination vows. Well, we published this story and the public response was, oh my. The private one is, what the hell is this guy thinking, uh, Bishop Hunt? Um, yeah, it's easy to be celibate when you're in your early 70s, late 60s. <laughs> it's the 80s. I don't uh, know. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, oh, not, I mean, I'm not there it, yet. It, okay. it's yeah, so. Well, to be non-celibate, you have to make an appointment with a doctor right. and get some pills. <laughs> so, I mean, it takes some effort. But the, the, the point being, uh, there's been disquiet with the leadership of the Free Church of England because some of its members are old-time Protestants and Calvin Robinson is very anglo-catholic so its nature is changing and then there was this terrible fight over finances of a closing mm -hmm. church and the largest portion of the free church of england which was its brazilian branch quit um, and broke off from them and this is a this is another black guy because i i asked gavin ashenden i said gavin do you know this fellow? i said yes yes i knew him and I didn't know he was gay. Well, maybe there were signs, <laughs> signs. but Gavin, you know, was <laughs> you know, maybe what was I missing? But the point is, this was not common knowledge amongst the clergy that there was somebody in a partnered civil relationship amongst their ranks. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is celibacy and a civil partnership. Is that acceptable? Well, um, it is in, in, it in is the Church of England, it is. It is in the Church of England. You're supposed to be celibate, no, the, which the is bishop, always given a bishop, wink, wink, nod, nod. The Bishop said you don't have to be celibate anymore. Well, that's yeah, right, Kevin. Thank you're you. right. I'm sorry. It used to be you had to be celibate. Um, I don't know if I want to even get into this fight because I don't know what I think. I hate to say it that way about this celibate. I do know what I think about the issue of same-sex marriage. Oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, I don't believe it is a lifestyle that is permissible for someone who is a minister of the gospel. 
I don't believe or, someone who or, is or, or, or a Christian. I mean, it, 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 or a same sex relationship uh, involving sexuality uh, uh, um, is not a design of God for a relationship. Okay, God's design for a lifelong relationship is male and female in a marriage. That's just his design. Now, you and I have a wonderful friendship. I don't find you particularly attractive. You probably don't find me particularly attractive. But and the two of us won't fit in that no, bed back of you. I'm you sorry, are, Kevin. That bed ain't going to do it. Uh, but you know, our friendship is an incredibly strong bond. Uh, but that's as far as you know our same sex relationships goes. Uh, I don't know. Well, I think it, it speaks to one of the themes that we've been sp talking about obliquely over these years is the death of male yeah. friendship and of male companionship in the United States. Um, in my congregation, I would say it's 40% male. Very few, if any of these men, and most of them are within my age, plus or minus 15 years. Very few of them have best friends. They've got their wives, they've got their work companions, they've got their buddies that they golf with or whatever, but the true you know, friendship as an art seems to have been lost on my generation. I mean, uh, certainly, I mean, I count you my friend, but I can't really say I have anybody else I have my brothers, eh, one of them is not my friend, but I've got another one who is. If, you know what I'm trying to say, it, that we've it, lost so It is. Much. I mean, my life is full of friends. Um, you know, mm -hmm. my neighbors I'm great friends with, many of them would call me their best friend um, mm -hmm. and have. Well, everybody likes I, you, Kevin. I'm so. a likable, pleasant person, but I'm also a person who will listen uh, and have honest conversations. My kids don't like that I have honest conversations, but my friends do. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that's that's the way God made me. But the the contemporary modernity of friendship is gone. They, they don't know what it means anymore. You know, the friendship now is going on Facebook and and reading posts of your friends. Nobody writes letters anymore. Nobody calls anymore. And basically, when you're going places, you're seeing family, whether you are friends in, in your travels. And, and I'm guilty of that. We did that. Every uh, summer vacation was going, coming back here to Madison and, and seeing mom, dad, and, and some of our friends. That was it. Yeah. Right. There was a big lightning flash outside, and a bang, and everything went off. That's cool. So, yeah, you had a little power surge. <laughs> it went offline. Uh, Jill's climbing. I didn't behind. know you got a small dog. I got a small dog oh, named she. Jill. Oh, you're, you're going out? No. No. Oh, you need the credit card. Oh, she's online shopping. She needs the credit card. So, uh, and to just follow up, you know, friendship uh, as a structure needs to be retaught by the church. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, friendship is a, a wonderful, blessed design and a gift from God. And there's so many great examples in Scripture uh, of friendships that we need to revisit immediately so all right we covered that topic let's go on here and get the next one here uh, oh, friends jonathan no jonathan fletcher uh, we, we oh my needed, the story continues and uh, uh what happens if you you do all the right things but you're not a bishop if there's consequences george one rule for the rich one for the poor yeah. or the church equivalent yeah, purple and uh, black <laughs> robin weeks was the incumbent of a manual church in wimbledon which was jonathan fletcher's old church he was he followed fletcher and he was the one who basically the crisis blew up in his face and his handling of of the revelations wasn't bad but it wasn't good and he was zinged a few times for not being more transparent, but he did all the right things. He, you know, this was due to him and this and that. Well, he resigned from Emmanuel Wimbledon, and now it was announced that he's left the ministry and he's going to be a history teacher at uh, Radley College, which is a private boys' school in mm -hmm. Oxfordshire. Um, in essence, his career was destroyed 
even though he was not a perpetrator, nor was he an enabler. And his culpability was far less than someone named Justin. Uh, and I'm not talking about the Bishop of Central Florida. Uh, it's been five years since uh, Justin Welby said he would talk to the John Smythe uh, survivors and he would get involved in the Jonathan Fletcher business. Silence, they push him off. Uh, that Stephen Croft, the Bishop of Oxford, did really bad things in the Trevor, uh, Trevor Van de, the Trevor well, case. Yeah, yeah, Trevor case, yeah. And he's still Bishop of Oxford. Whereas somebody with a degree of integrity like Robin Weeks, who accepted responsibility, even though he didn't do it, but he was the person the buck had to stop with him. He has, he's a casualty of Jonathan uh, Fletcher and his uh, career now has an unexpected break to teach little boys history. Well, at least, it, I mean, it's not Starbucks. You know, he, I mean, he's he's going to have a, a, a nice income, but you know, there's nobody holds or is able to hold uh, by design the Archbishop of Canterbury accountable. Nobody holds mm -hmm. the Church of England bishops accountable by design. There's just no mechanism in there uh, where there's going to be any accountability. It's pretty easy to hold a clergy person within the Church of England accountable especially if they're on the wrong side of the politic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a sad story. Let's move on. Oh, okay. You know, since the retirement of Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, it's fine. It's hard to find a favorite character in, in, in the church. And she was certainly one of mine. Uh, Pope Francis is a good second. And Pope Francis, uh, the lovely, the lovely Pope that is, uh, was at a QA when he, what, what country was he in? He was in uh, Portugal. Portugal. And in that QA, they were asking him questions, and he decides what a great opportunity I have here in Portugal to attack the traditional Roman Catholic, to attack the, the American Roman Catholic, to attack the, the Trump Roman Catholic, if it were. And uh, I'm, I'm, oh, George, this. This is, we could just have Francis unscripted. Would be a, a, we would make a mint if we just sat here and talked about Francis all day. Oh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Oh my. Francis was addressing the Portuguese province of the Society of Jesus, that's the Jesuits, yeah. on uh, August 5th. And just this past week, uh, the Catholic uh, newspaper led um, one of the Catholic newspapers printed a transcript of his conversation. And one of the questions was about the United States. And Francis took that as an opportunity to really smack down what I would call the EWTN Catholics, the, mm -hmm. the trad cads, Catholics. Uh, he said, there's a very strong reactionary attitude uh, in American Catholicism uh, that shapes the way people belong, even emotionally. And I'm going to quote, I would like to remind these people that being backward looking is useless. And we understand there's, there's an appropriate evolution in the understanding of matters and faith and morals. This is, you know, it's one thing to call the conservative slack jawed troglodytes who, uh, uh, can't get out of their own way. It's another thing to say that they're backwards and are not get hep to the times, man, that they're not evolving. You know, let's oh, bring out I the Bob Dylan record and the times I they are a-changing. It's far worse than that. This is Pope Francis's deplorables moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you're deplorable for being a traditional Catholic. You yeah. know, because you're wearing concrete for boots, you know, you're not going nowhere. It's crazy. And this is where the growth of the Catholic Church is. This is the growth in seminarians is coming from the traditionalist yeah. wing. Yeah. And Francis is, uh, I mean, Francis is uh, pissing on it from a great height. Uh, and he, maybe he's got a Joe Biden moment where he just doesn't have the filters working. And maybe he thought he was in a friendly audience of Jesuits and they all can snicker at American conservatives. But mm -hmm. this is very... 
Now, Justin Welby has said unkind things about you and me, but we laugh at it and we actually use it as our advertising material. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. <laughs> if you're a Catholic and the Pope says bad things about you, you're a bad Catholic um, because he's the Pope. I Francis has an Episcopalian attitude and I use that term specifically, not in a, in a capital E Episcopalian attitude. Okay, sure. Like, okay, yeah. a, like a member of the Episcopal Church of the USA, of his understanding of so many things, uh, theology, um, the charism of episcopacy, uh, of politics. Uh, and we've seen what it's done to the American Episcopal Church. We see what it's doing. It's, we see what's going about to do in Brisbane, Australia. We see what it's doing in the Church of England. It's not bringing people in; it is repelling them. Uh, well, it, it's giving the enemies of the church fodder. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden the enemies say, "You know, Pope Francis doesn't like the evangelical, the the Orthodox, the you know the Anglo-Catholic, Anglican or Catholic you know portion of the Roman Catholic Church." He doesn't, you know, like that at all, and he's he's now not preaching against it, but answering QA questions to say that is not desirable for Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do better, and so your enemies now have uh, fodder to use against you. Yeah, it exactly right, Kevin. It's at the lower levels of the Catholic hierarchy uh, that this will see its maximum effect of people being denied entry in the ordination process because they're conservatives, clergy being exiled to uh, Okeechobee, Florida, if mm -hmm. they're conservative. It, it, it's just how it's just giving guidance to the machine, the blob of to how to behave. And if the Pope at the man at the top can be this unguarded and this uncharitable in his language, what will it mean for the people further down the, the stream? That's that's the point. All right, uh, we have a president of the House of Bishops or Dep Deputies, uh, Julia Harris, in the Episcopal Church, is filing a sexual harassment complaint against a retired bishop who we will name not now because we don't know who it is. Julia Harris was uh, elected uh, at this last general convention president of the House of Deputies. And it surfaced this week when she sent a letter to the members of the House of Deputies that when she was elected, a retired bishop came up and gave her a hug of sorts and evidently mm -hmm. squeezed some things that shouldn't be squeezed on somebody who's not your wife. Um, she took it to be sexual harassment. However, and so she's filed a formal Title IV disciplinary complaint against this retired bishop, and it's starting to chug through the system, and she went public with it uh, this past uh, a year after it happened. Now, um, which either means that it's reaching the point that they're going to name names and have an open trial, or they're about to dismiss it, and she wants to give it a bit of a prod to make sure it doesn't go away. Um, because we don't know details and we don't know the names, what do we take away from this? And from my reading of it is the left is now turning on itself. The, the, well, it's eating its own children. That the, the, This Julia Harris is a left-wing woman. She is Hispanic with a capital H, her, her maiden name is Ayala. Um, and she was groomed to for a high position by the liberal old guard. And now that she's in a high position, that liberal male old guard, she is now starting to devour. But and stepping back here, she has every right to file a, a sexual harassment uh, complaint if she was sexually harassed. The yeah. problem is we, we've kind of lost the definitions of what that means. Or oh, it's being redefined every day in every case. Uh, but if she feels she's sexually harassed by a bishop, absolutely file a complaint or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, take it up because that's your right. And that's how we hold bishops accountable. That's, you know, so I'm, I'm all for that. But yes, in its effect, uh, this could just be the, the, the left eating the left. Well, the Me Too movement has did a lot of good. It also did a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. um, it basically ended the tyranny of some lecherous people in work environments. Uh, mm -hmm. Claimed some prominent victims good. like the producer good. Jeffrey. Ep uh, yeah, absolutely. what was his name? 
Uh, not Epstein. Uh, well, he's gone too. The, the movie producer, <laughs> uh, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it gave carte blanche to give an angry person a blanket attack. Uh, it's just like today, if you call somebody a racist, it's a meaningless comment because everything is racist. Right. Uh, everything. And so your point is very well taken, Kevin. If it was sexual harassment, then action needs to be taken. And the Absolutely. person who did this needs to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't, and if it's just a power game, well, that's not such a good thing. But it's what I've come to expect from the Episcopal Church's leadership. And, I mean, that's the strange thing we find is you always want to have a witness. Mm -hmm. Where there is no witnesses, it's called he said, she said. Or in, in legal terms, hearsay. And so, you know, that's... That's one of the problems with the Me Too movement is, you know, sometimes there's a lack of witnesses. Sometimes the witnesses are in a story that's 25 years old and they don't remember the event happening. All right. Times of London has taken a poll, sent out a little email to all the clergy in the Church of England. And the questions were, are you, where do you fall in this range? Are you pro-gay or pro-tradition? Are you pro-women or pro uh, uh, a male only uh, uh, clergy and stuff like that and uh, Times of London was pretty happy with the results published them and said you know this is a turning point for the Church of England we are more, more liberal now uh, much more so I was we probably majority liberal and it's time for the church itself to change George hmm. yeah the Times did a front page splash, which is really good for the religion reporter. Uh, she gets her double double dose there. Uh, some of the questions were the majority, overwhelming majority, said that they don't believe Britain's a Christian country anymore. I don't think that's uh, we agree. Uh, we agree. We agree. Yeah. But then uh, the majority would approve for a woman Archbishop of Canterbury. The majority are in favor of gay marriage. The majority are in favor of ending the opt-out clause for people opposed to women clergy. Mm -hmm. And the initial response from the left was, see, we told you so. We finally uh, re reached the majority. So now the bishops need to follow our lead and introduce all this stuff. Well, then came the uh, the. Uh, green eye shade fellas, uh, Peter Old, uh, David Old's brother, twin brother, yep. Yep. who's a statistician. Uh, a very good statistician. And he um, looked at this and said, this is a junk poll. This is junk because they picked 5,000 names out of the clergy of the Church of England and emailed them. And 1,500 odd responded. It's not how you do a poll. I mean, don't have a sampling. You don't have, it just wouldn't, it doesn't cut the mustard. It's a, it's basically a glorified internet poll. And I got an email from one priest at the Church of England. Well, we did, Anglican Inc. got an email. And I went to me in and, and I said, you know, I got this request to answer, but I didn't answer it because I'm not going to tell somebody at the Times what I think on these issues because I could get canceled. Whereas, uh, you know, somebody who's proud and loud and all this and that, they want the world to know. So it was a self-selected audience. So what it really tells us about the composition of the Church of England's clergy is that there's a strong liberal bloc. We already knew that. Yeah. Are there majority? Yes, we have no idea. Yeah. Uh, are these uh, the rectors of major churches? Are, are these the non stipendary priest who takes it up at 62 after a career teaching or in social work. We don't know. Um, it was junk. And Ian Paul, a lot, it generated a lot of uh, feedback. Uh, Michael Nazarali, uh, Ian Paul had some videos which we posted on Anglican Inc., uh, as well as pro and anti uh, evaluations. But it, it's like political polling. You know, what we saw at the last few elections is that you get what you pay for. And if you want a poll to say X, you'll get a poll to say X. Yeah. Well, we can agree the trajectory is this poll, the results. Yeah, I, I think okay. it's a fair, I think it's a fair statement saying the trajectories of some clergy mm -hmm. seems to be in this direction. But 
what we've noticed at least the last 10 or 15 years is the tyranny now of the minority. Mm-hmm. The minority voice is able to object more power than they deserve or have earned. And they do that through cancellation. They do that for, for, through being loud, but also for owning the press. The minority owns journalism. The minority owns uh, Western politics. The minority owns who and what and the, Na- the United Nations and all that. And so that tyranny is becoming very powerful to the point where if I got the same poll, even as a journalist, I would, I, eh, you know, I, I post less controversial stuff on Facebook now just because I don't want one of my customers to be contacted and have to decide whether or not to keep my company as a, uh, uh, a vendor. So, mm-hmm. You know, just a little less. I now on scripted. I still do everything I do. I keep it a good, honest conversation here. But you know, I know who I know the type of uh, person who is my audience, and they they're probably five years older than me, a little grayer too. So let's move on to. Oh, we did have a good news story, and one of the complaints Anglican Unscripted has gotten for the last twelve or fifteen years is that you guys, you know, you only talk about the bad stuff or the controversial stuff happening around the world and yes we're guilty as journalists we know that uh good news does not sell content good news is not something you click on oh there's a new garden at the bishop's house to, you know here's new photos that really doesn't do it however i would say easily a good acne sh- story about church planting does get the clicks it does get the people interested in reading it but also commenting on it because they have common experiences uh the acna has planted uh many churches over the last 10 years and you and i both know that's a 50 50 gambit for every church you every two churches you plant one will fail it's the way it works you know you're spe- you're throwing seeds everywhere and and at some point you get to hit the rocky ground the northeast sometimes you you land in atlanta boom 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 church 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 and jeff walton put out a nice story about falls church and their you know decades-long desire and ability to plant churches and it is a success a success story george and it's a success for Jeff Walton because yeah. this is was the most read story up till this morning uh, for the week on Anglican on Anglican Inc. His story yeah. about the Falls Church in Virginia. Falls Church has something called the Timothy Program, I believe, where they take a curate and essentially they help him plant a church. And over the last five years, these Timothy curates have planted seven churches. And as you mentioned, uh, church plants are like restaurants. They fail within the first year or two. They're either going to make it or they don't. All of these have succeeded, and some of them have launched daughter congregations. And it really is a remarkable statement to the leadership of the Diocese of Mid-Atlantic, the uh, leaders at the Falls Church, and they're picking the right curates to do this. Because you just can't put any priest out there, any minister out there, and say, go plant a church. It takes special training. It takes special uh, gifts. Um, It takes a real heart to make this happen. It takes uh, false churches done it. Yeah, somebody with a little bit more risk, you know, uh, ability than your average priest. Your average priest Mm -hmm. is bringing in uh, a a starter family from seminaries. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're starting their, their family and their career and stuff like that. They don't want to be worried, you know about the bills next month they don't want to be worried and so to find these type of people to plant churches is amazing but it's not just one person that you know they have a great current but they often have a team of 10 and 20 people uh, with the financial ability with the planning ability with administration ability to go into an area and help plant a church they borrow them from the churches you know Mm -hmm. a, a a church plants a church and it's good to see this. And you know, it's kind of that at the ACNA model that they've uh, desired from day one when uh, Bishop Duncan says we're going to plant 5,000 churches. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, right. We don't know how. And he's right. And the people who responded to Bishop Duncan and said, we don't know how to plant churches, they were very honest. They don't. Now the ACNA is a, a church planting, uh, you know, a beacon. So, oh, cool. It, they do have the advantage that they can pick their shots. 
Yes. As you said, you know, if church planting in the suburbs of Boston, I don't think it's going to be that successful. Too or close Hartford, to Yale, yeah, or Yale and Harvard, all that, yeah, yeah. Church planting in the D.C. area, expanding suburbia in Atlanta, uh, Orlando, uh, areas that are growing, San Diego, Orange mm -hmm. County. I think that those are successful areas. The Rust Belt uh, is hard. Um, where I am, rural Florida, uh, I've been wanting to plant a church down in the neighboring town of Homosassa for years. And my way forward is to get enough money to get a curate, get him in here, and then launch it, launch him onto the residence of Homosassa. But my neighbors and the other Episcopal churches are all f afraid that they will people will leave their church to go to his church. Yeah. So the, the problem we have is a fear of competition, that competition is bad, uh, that uh, my loss is your gain, when, re when really we should be looking at this as, as a win-win for everybody, uh, not just reshuffling the existing cards in the church deck, but bringing new people to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what the Falls Church seems to have been able to have done. And that's, a, I think, was what's... This is a major story, and I really look to see how it goes over the years. Is it just charismatic leadership, and when one guy goes away, it all falls apart? I don't know. I think it's an ethos, though. The, the, the idea is the church itself, the church as a whole, is planting a church. So mm -hmm. uh, when they plant the church, they send not just money resources, but they, they send a, a starter congregation. You know, mm -hmm. to, to get everything going. And so uh, it's the mission of the starter congregation to be part of it all. Uh, I attend a uh, planted church in Tampa, uh, an mm -hmm. Anglican church. The church I attend was planted by a non-denominational church. They planted an Anglican church, and uh, it's working. And within one year, this church has a building that uh, somebody donated. So they have a real church. Uh, in one year, uh, they're, they're probably to the point now that they have to go to two services. Uh, they filled out the the... the my time, my 10.30 when I go there, it's pretty full. I have to get there early now. I have to grab my coffee half an hour before I get to church, and I have to get there 15 minutes early to get Kevin's spot. If I show up at 10 to 10.30 or 10.20, my spot's gone. Somebody's taken it. There is, though, the human element that I think is very important. Uh, I had, we had an article about an Episcopal church in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, okay. which is a wealthy Sure. vacation destination they uh raised 10 million dollars from 50 families in the congregation uh within a few months to build a basically an outreach center um i don't care how wealthy a community it is that the person who has that vision of this is what we're going to do to bring christ to the community you've, you've got to be able to i don't like this word but sell it and get people to buy into it and share it so that they sign on the dotted line. Now, I don't think 50 families at my church will raise $10 million. I don't think we've got all those, they don't have the assets that Jackson Hole does. But it does take a special sort of priest who has that vision and charisma and who has the backing of, a, as you say, an organization to make it effective. Yeah. And all things, and these things are possible. Yeah, and, and I, uh, I salute the Jackson Hole, and I salute the Falls Church for being able to do great oh, absolutely. things. It's great, and it, it's great that you know a vision that was thrown out there, you know, by uh, Archbishop Duncan a long time ago, and and got a lot of pushback. I remember talking to people, especially priests, when the, the ACNA first formed. Uh, some Amia priests and bishops were like, "It can't be done. We don't have." The, and the people in the seminaries we don't have you know it, it was just listed out all the things we can't do and okay we didn't meet the timeline but we're certainly planting the churches now we just had to put together the organization and make church planting not about the priest but about the team and, mm -hmm. and, and teach churches to be church planters and i think that's that's come now in honesty there's a lot of priests i know 45 and older who are not ever going to be church planters you know and, you, and I know a few priests who are church <laughs> closers. Church <laughs> closers. You know, I, I, I hate to give away a, you know, a demographic, but young people in our church are, are doing wonderful things. And so are lay people. Yeah, it's wonderful to, to see lay ministries uh, flourish 
uh, in Anglicanism around the world. All right. Uh, you got this far. You saw that we had a little break because George had a power outage. I don't know if we're over or under time here. It's just half an hour. I'm, I'm bending that's double that. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 819 of Anglican Unscripted.